in ANOVA, F ratio uh, is calculated by partitioning the total variance into two component variances. In case of one factor between subject ANOVA, the total variance, um, denoted as SST, is divided into the variance due to the experimental effect, um, denoted as SSM, and other remaining variance, uh, which you call error sum of the score SSE. First, let's look at the expected variance due to the experimental effect or the effect of between subject factor. It is first estimated by calculating the model sum of squares, of which operation is essentially the same as calculating the variance. So if you think about you know, how you calculate the variance, the very first thing you need to do is to calculate the mean. Um, for model squares of model sum of the squares, um, you need to calculate the two means. So um, this x bar in the bracket is representing the grand mean. So this is a mean of every score, right? And there's another mean you have to calculate is the x bar sub i, which is the uh, the ith group mean. So for example, if you have like three groups to compare. And then, you know, you, you're going to have to calculate three group means. And you, so this um, small i is the group index, and the big i represents the total number of groups you have. And this big um, symbol is sigma, which is adding signs. So whatever you have this sigma, you basically add whatever uh, is on the right of that symbol, right? So you calculate first deviance between these two means. So um, first start with the first group mean minus the grand mean, and this deviance is squared. And for that group, you multiply the number of individuals in that group. So the big J represents the total number of individuals in, the, in that group. So you multiply that number to the square deviance and you add all the square deviance across all groups. And then you're going to get model sum of the square. And next, uh, you need to calculate the uh, residual sum of squares or error sum of the squares. Um, so this is the amount of remaining variability um, because of the individual difference in each group. So in this case, um, you need to subtract each individual scores uh, within the group. So the i, j, uh, they are just index of group and the individual in a group. And x represents the individual data. And this uh, minus and group mean. So this x bar sub i represents the group mean, right? So that deviance is a squared within the group, right? Across all the subject. Um, and then that variant, uh, the, the, you know, that square deviance added across all the groups. And this way, you can calculate the SSR or SSE. If you add these together, um, SSR plus SSN, that'll give you the total variance. Okay, so this is the total amount of variability where no differences between the groups assumed as if uh, every datum uh, uh, or sampled from a one big distribution with a single mean. And so if you know these two terms, then you can you know, automatically calculate the total sum of the square, but you can calculate the total uh, sum of the square using this equation. So you just subtract every score from the grand mean. So this time x bar is grand mean, and then you square this deviance um, add all this up across the individuals, across the group, that you're going to get total sum of the square. And now what we have 
calculated so far is just a sum of squares, right? So they're just a um, kind of a total variability um, um, in the model and the uh, the residuals. Now, if we divide each sum of square by their um, degrees of freedom, the respective degrees of freedom, then they will become the variance basically right so the model mean square so in this case we have more kind of a general term mean square instead of a variance um, so model mean square can be calculated by <coughs> dividing model sum of the square by the model degrees of freedom which is basically i minus one so total number of groups minus one <coughs> on the other hand the residual mean square uh, can be calculated by dividing SSR, the residual sum of the square, by the residual sum, uh, degrees of freedom. So in this case, the residual degrees of freedom is J minus 1, where the J represents the total number of subject and minus the number of groups, total number of groups we have. So F ratio is basically the ratio between these two variances, the variance quantity, the model mean square and residual mean square. And we have two degrees of freedom, right? As I said before, so DF1 is the model degrees of freedom, DF2 is the residual degrees of freedom, and uh, what's on the numerator is MSM, model mean square, and what's in the denominator is residual mean square, MSR. So, if this F ratio is greater than some F critical uh, at alpha 0.5, or if the probability of obtaining the F observed, so um, the P value is less than alpha 0.5, then we know that at least one of the group means differ from the others. Otherwise, meaning that the P value is greater then alpha 0.5, then all means are considered same, statistically speaking. Okay, now that we know how to calculate um, F ratio, let's play this game of uh, NHST for one way between subject ANOVA. Um, so here is a kind of a hypothetical a summary of the hypothetical study where a diet pill was tested on its efficacy and by measuring the amount of weight loss in pounds so lbs represents pounds not kilogram over 12 months so they recruited 15 volunteers so the total n is 15 here and they were randomly and equally assigned to either control placebo or experimental condition so in this case we have three groups to compare right and they are between groups because um, these groups are mutually exclusive and any individual subject assigned to um, the um, the respective group is only tested once right so this is the example of between subject so the factor here is um, the drug condition right different drug condition where um, the level one is control level two is placebo and level three is actual uh, drug condition so this is a one factor and between subject with the three levels right so, um, the first thing you need to do is to set up hypotheses. Um, so, we know that this is a, in a case of one way between subject and NOVA. The null hypothesis would be that you know, all the group means should be the same. So, there should be no difference in terms of amount of weight loss after they're treated with the drug for 12 months. And the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the group means is different from other group means. So that is the alternative hypothesis in case of the one way um, between subject and ANOVA. And this table, oops, 
this table is a kind of a um, summary table, um, a summary outcome measure uh, recorded for each subject and uh, 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 across the groups. Right, so we have control, placebo treatment, and here the left column represents the subject index. And then this column represents different groups. And the numbers here uh, represents the amount of weight loss um, in pounds. So um, let's calculate the um, total sum of the square by calculating the grand mean. Um, there, there's kind of a, um, two different ways you can calculate the group mean, the grand mean that you just add all these numbers, all the 15 numbers up and divide this sum by 15, then you get um, <clears throat> grand mean. Or you can calculate the mean of each group and take the mean of these three groups by adding these three and then divide it by three, then you're going to get 3.47 as a grand mean. So to calculate the SST, the total sum of the square, you basically subtract um, this grand mean, 3.47, from every score, right? So that is the deviance between the grand mean and each individual datum. And next, you have to square them, right, to remove the sign. And then you add them all up. So if you add this, uh, if you add this, you know, column-wise, you get sum of the squares for each group, right? So this is the uh, sum of the square for control. This is sum of the square for placebo. And this is sum of the square for drug group. So that is actually the um, uh, equation introduced previously. So you just subtract every data from the grand mean and then square them um, and add them all over um, across the groups, then you get total sum of the square. So if you add these up, then you're going to get total sum of the square as 43.74. So here is a kind of a graphical representation of uh, what deviance is calculated to calculate the total sum of the square. So what we have on the x-axis is just the um, you know, participants. Um, we have you know, 15 participants, right? And on the y-axis, we have the amount of weight loss in pounds. Now this thin black horizontal line represents the location of the grand mean, which is a 3.47. Right, and the line, these you know vertical lines from each datum, each participant's datum, represents the deviance. So the individual deviance from the grand mean to the data. Right, does it make sense? And then their group membership is. Uh, distinguished by different colors. So the red color represents control group participant and green color represents um, placebo uh, participants and the blue represents the uh, the drug condition, the treatment condition group, uh, the data, right? And these dotted line with different color represents the group mean. Um, so the group mean for um, the control was two point something. Uh, two point two, yeah. And then group mean for uh, the placebo was a three point two, right? And uh, the group mean for the drug was five pounds. So in <coughs> calculating the deviance to calculate the uh, total sum of the square, it is the distance between the grand mean from each individual data.
Okay, so that is what this graph means. On the other hand, the deviance statistics is different in um, other sum of the squares. So for example, uh, the residual sum of the square, to calculate the residual sum of the square, uh, uh, then the individual scores in each group is subtracted from the group mean. So for example, the control group, those data those participants' um, um, data are subtracted from the control group mean, which was 2.2. And for placebo, uh, the group mean was 3.2. So each individual datum is subtracted from that group mean, and so on. So for drug, the group mean was 5. So uh, 5 is subtracted from each individual datum. And Again, you need to square this deviance and sum them up to calculate the residual sum of the square, which is now 23.6. And this is the, uh, the graphical representation um, of a different where um, this is actually showing how the deviant statistics is calculated to calculate the residual sum of the square. Everything is uh, the same. Now the deviance for residual sum of the square is the distance between um, the group data from the group mean, right? So that is different from the deviance um, used in calculating the total sum of the square where it was the distance between the datum and the grand mean, right? Um, yes, and then that. But for residual sum of the square, you subtract group mean from uh, the data in that group. Now to the model sum of the square. Um, in calculating model sum of the square, you first to uh, replace the column data with the column mean. So we have control group mean as 2.2, placebo 3.2, and drug um, 5. Now all these data will be replaced with the corresponding group mean. That is the first step. And then now you calculate the deviance between these replaced data um, from the grand mean, right? So you calculate the deviance from the grand mean from uh, the group mean, basically. And then you take the square of this deviance and add them all up. And you can calculate the um, uh, model sum of the square by adding all these uh, sum of the squares and it turns out to be uh, 20.1 now again this is a graphical representation of the model sum of the square where you know, all these individual data are replaced with the respective group mean right? um, so that is the model sum of the square Now, we need to calculate the uh, mean square. Um, so the model mean square is basically the uh, model sum of the square divided by the model degrees of freedom. In this case, we have three groups, right? Minus one becomes two. So um, the model mean square. So that is basically the model variance, uh, the variance in the model, um, which is 10.05. And the residual mean square is um, 23.6. So that is so that was the you know sum of the residual sum of the square for uh, residual sum of the square, and then you divide this by uh, the residual degrees of freedom, which is 15 total number of data minus total number of groups we have. So um, the residual mean square is less, it's about 2, so it looks like uh, the f value will be about 5, right? 
Um, so you, when you report the, the F statistics, you need to say F and then two degrees of freedom, two and 12 um, with F value. And then you also have to report the P value um, that you will see this F statistics or more extreme. Um, in this case, we can compare the p-value against the alpha or we can compare the critical statistics against the 5.1 so the critical statistics here is at you know where, where the end of the curve of the right tail becomes 0.05 is uh, 3.89 in fact we can't use jamovi to um, find out this critical f statistics so here is our Jamovi, and to find out the critical F statistics with this given degrees of freedom, you need this the distraction function module. So you just click and you click F distribution. Now you have to change the parameters of F. Um, so you just change the degrees of freedom to and 12. And you want to compute the uh, quantile. So this is inverse cumulative function, in fact. And so say it's a 0.95. Right? So this um, value, F value, is the critical F statistics where the area under this right side of the tail right, becomes alpha 0.05. So the critical value is a 3.885. Um, which is about 3.89 if you round it up from the three decimal places to the second. So that's what we have here, right? So that's the critical statistics. Um, so that's where the critical statistics is. So that is F crit. 3.89 and where is our statistics f observed it's about here 5.1 so that is f observed so the f observed is greater than 3.89 right what that means is that our F statistics is statistically significant because the area under the curve here, so um, see that, that area under the curve is by definition alpha 0.05. Now, our p-value is defined by this area, this red area, right? So that means our p-value, even if we don't know exact p-value here, we know that that is less than alpha 0.5. Okay. No, sorry. So our p-value is less than this alpha 0.05. So we know that um, at least one group mean is different from the others. So we can make a decision now. So if f is not significant, so if you fail to reject the null, then you stop and report that your f is not statistically significant when you have when you have a significant f then you need to proceed with postdoc analysis to identify where this difference is coming from so what we just reject and then what we're left with uh, is this alternative hypothesis where we say at least one of the group means is different from the other group means but there can be 
many different possibilities, right? Uh, it is maybe the difference coming from the control and placebo, but then the placebo and the drug means are the same. Or it can be just that the difference is coming from the difference between the placebo and drug group means, not from the control group and so on. So the goal of the, uh, the further analysis uh, we call post hoc analysis is to find out where this difference is, where this uh, statistical difference is coming from between which two groups. So we run post hoc analysis, um, especially when we do not have any a priori predictions about the uh, comparisons. Um, so there's another way to do. Um, further analysis called planned comparisons when you do have a priori predictions uh, between the groups but in general um, post hoc analysis is performed uh, which um, consists of pairwise comparisons um, between every possible combinations so what's available in Jamovi uh, is uh, two keys, honestly significant difference. This is a um, um, you know most popular post hoc analysis or post hoc test um, for homoscedastic groups of same size. So that means um, you know, the, the the number of samples should be same as in the previous example. Also, uh, the equality variance. Um, so the, the variance between these groups should be more or less equal. Um, if you want to uh, have tight control over the type 1 error, then you can use Bonferroni um, correction, but that is actually bits the purpose of running ANOVA if we have to use Bonferroni correction. Um, Holmes procedure, step time procedure, is actually better than the Bonferroni in that it actually keeps the alpha overall alpha at 0.05 uh, but without sacrificing much um, uh, of the sensitivity of the given test. So it actually suppressed the uh, inflation of the type 2 errors uh, as well as the type 1 error at the same time. Um, Games Howell is also available when um, you have unequal variances between the groups. And also finally, Shifas uh, is used for unequal sample size. Right, so um, again, because you know ANOVA is a parametric, uh, there's a specific assumptions and what to do you know, after each um, assumption is violated, uh, as in the t-test. So, you know, these assumptions are basically the same as uh, the t-test of difference, um, you know, for the um, independent samples, um, except that they apply to uh, more than two groups here. So, you want to check the normality, you, you know, with uh, shapiro work test, even though um, ANOVA is um, known that you know, it is quite robust against uh, a violation of normality. So if the normality is not very um, serious, then it's okay to uh, uh, run uh, the F-test uh, with a, um, you know, a minor violation. Equality of variance, um, again, this is the same assumptions you need to test with Levine's test. When this is violated, then there is another parametric um, test called Welch's F-test available in Jamovi. So this is actually a parametric um, test with correction, taking account into differences in varia uh, variance between the groups. Um, so... I mean, ANOVA is known for, um, uh, you know, highly robust, being highly robust against all these uh, assumptions behind the data, but it is highly recommended to have equal number of uh, samples across the groups 
for the um, uh, one way between uh, subject and ANOVA. And when the uh, normality assumption is violated, then we can use the non-parameter alternative called Crusco Wallace test. Now this is uh, how to report the um, ANOVA um, analysis. So basically you have to just uh, follow the um, same order um, when you report the uh, t-test result. You have to report the descriptive you know, statistics, you know, summary statistics, uh, such as mean and standard deviation of each group. And also you need to include the result from the assumption check. So you have to report the um, shapiro work test uh, for the normality. And also you need to report the result from the Levine's test for the equality of variance. And after that, you can report the uh, main result of F-test. Uh, for example, in our previous case, um, you can report as like, you know, there was a significant effect of the diet pill on the weight loss and report the F-test with all the degrees of freedom, uh, F to 12 equals to, and actual F statistics, 5.12 with the p-value, right? p equals 0.02. So we know that this f is significant, then you move on to uh, report the uh, post hoc analysis result, which is a follow-up result. Um, so here's the example, post hoc analysis using two keys, honestly significant difference revealed that the pill significantly reduced weight compared to the control group um, and report the p-value. Uh, sometimes people report the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference, but it is not available in Jamovi. And then you just keep reporting all the pairwise comparison result yeah, in reporting the p-value. Right, so um, if the normality assumption is violated, um, as I said, you can use a non-parametric alternative to one way between subject and over, which is crucial Wallis test. Um, so this test uses the same principle as in the other non-parametric tests, such as Man and Whitney test. Um, and basically all these tests, non-parametric tests, convert the raw data into uh, the ordinal level of measurement and run the analysis based on the rank data. So um, basically you can report the medians and IQRs as main summary descriptive statistics instead of means and standard deviations. Um, if you choose to run this uh, non-parametric uh, alternative test. Um, I believe it is okay to report both median, both sets of descriptive statistics, uh, but because uh, this is non-parametric, it is more fitting to report uh, the medians and IQR as uh, main summary descriptive statistics. Um, so after the descriptive statistics, basically you're going to say that you know, one of the assumptions were violated, so the normality assumption is basically violated, you um, still need to report the, uh, the assumption check result. And you don't have to report the Levine's test result for crystal Wallace because, you know, you run this crystal Wallace when the normality assumption is violated. So you report that the normality was violated uh, using Shapiro-Wilk along with the p-value, and then you move on to report main result. So the crucial Wallace test is H test, and the degrees of freedom is basically a number of groups minus one. And report the actual statistics crucial Wallace test with a p value associated with the crucial Wallace statistics. And Jamovi offers um, kind of a unique. Um, postdoc analysis called DSCF pairwise comparisons. Um, again, this is another um, postdoc analysis among like other numerous options. 
So you can use uh, the result of this test to report the result of postdoc analysis.